Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea is going to great length to attract international university students, for example through scholarships and programs taught in English. Over the past decade, the number of foreign students has increased eightfold, and now over 85,000 foreign students attend Korean universities. But while welcome on paper, they find themselves in a largely homogeneous society in which multiculturalism is a contentious issue, and this causes friction. To learn more about the situation of these students and multiculturalism in the Korean education system, we had the honor of interviewing Professor Rennie Moon. We discussed the different types of multiculturalism present in universities, the factors motivating students to come to Korea, the barriers limiting interactions between Korean and foreign students, as well as the role of foreign faculty members within the Korean education system. Rennie Moon is an assistant professor at the Underwood International College of Yonsei University, with a focus on higher education in the context of globalization. Her research and writings have been published not only in academic journals, but also in newspapers, such as the Donga Ilbo and Korea Daily Jungang Ilbo. Professor Moon obtained her bachelor's degree at Wellesley College and her PhD in International Comparative Education at Stanford University. Professor Rennie Moon, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you, Alan. How did you become interested in studying the linkage of education, diversity, and multiculturalism? I became interested in educational issues and educational reform because I have a background in education. I specialize in comparative education. Um, and at the time, I was very interested in human rights and how human rights as a norm begins to diffuse into national curricula. So I was interested in things like minority rights and diversity and multiculturalism and how those kinds of ideas appeared in uh, curricula. And in my paper, I talk about South Korean curricula. As naive as this question may be, why should countries and their universities care about multiculturalism? What are the advantages of multiculturalism, especially in an overwhelmingly homogeneous country like South Korea? We live in a global era, and um, with globalization, there's been much more mobility of people and students uh, of all kinds. And for homogeneous countries like Korea, they have to deal with the influx of foreigners and greater diversity because people are becoming more mobile. If you talk about the advantages, I mean, multiculturalism could be a useful discourse for countries like Korea that are homogeneous, that need some way of framing diversity within their borders. So the Korean government for a while has been promoting multicultural discourse uh, over the past decade or so. And that's been a way for Korea to deal with greater numbers of migrant workers who are coming into Korea, greater numbers of foreign students who are coming to, into Korea, as well as skilled labor. So in that sense, I think it's an advantage. And uh, in a way, it's uh, a discourse that makes Korea seem more uh, global. So I think it's symbolic in a lot of, in, in some ways. There are currently some 85,000 international students enrolled in Korean universities. Could you give us a brief overview of where they come from and what brings them to South Korea? Foreign students have been um, coming to Korea in larger numbers uh, over the past two decades. I mean, they come for several reasons. I mean, it depends on each student. But if you look at why they come to Korea, a lot of them are for instrumental reasons. For students from Asia, they come to Korea because it's close. It's easier to come to Korea financially and, I mean, distance-wise than going to Europe, the United States, or even Australia, which are much farther away. So they can visit their family whenever they want. They can feel not too far away from home. So that's one reason. Another reason is because it's much cheaper for higher education in Korea than to go to a Western country. And Korean students complain about high tuition at private universities in Korea all the time. But still, for foreign students, it's much cheaper than going to any higher education institution in a Western country. So cost is a huge factor. 
Another factor is that the Korean government has been giving lots of scholarships to foreign students. Um, so some of these students have you know, either full scholarships or part-time scholarships. So, I mean, that's a huge incentive for foreign students as well. So even if they were able to get admitted to a top university somewhere else, the financial incentives are just too high for those students to decide to go somewhere else. Uh, so that's another issue. These kinds of um, reasons that I mentioned right now are more um, instrumental. But students also come to Korea because of social reasons. A lot of students are influenced by K-pop and the youth culture and um, the Korean wave. They grew up listening to you know, Korean songs, watching Korean dramas. And surprisingly, that's a huge pull factor for foreign students. So there is the cost factor. I mean, it's cheaper. But at the same time, some students really like Korea. They come to Korea because they really like Korea. Maybe you came to Korea because you like Korea. <laughs> I would say those students come to Korea because of more identity-related reasons. And they think Korea is a very special place, a unique place. And Korea has things to offer them in terms of culture that they wouldn't be able to experience in other countries. And your second question about where they come from. Between 60 and 70 percent of the foreign students who come to Korea are from China. And the rest of the students mostly are from Southeast Asia, and then a very small percentage are from Western countries. In recent years, the South Korean government went to great lengths to increase the number of foreign students in Korea. As a result, the number of students has risen eightfold over the past decade. Where does this interest come from? I would say the interest of the Korean government to attract more foreign students comes from both domestic as well as international factors. So domestically, Korean universities are facing a shortage of consumers. There's a very low birth rate in Korea, so people aren't having enough babies. And because of this problem, the um, entrance quota for universities is decreasing. And so in the long run, what's going to happen is some universities are going to have to close down. And this is already happening in the non-metropolitan areas of Korea because there isn't enough Korean students to fill those spaces. So that kind of led Korean universities to look outside for more students. And that's why Korea attracts more foreign students because they can fill those empty slots. So the other factor has to do with kind of an international reason, and that's because Korean universities or universities all over the world, because of neoliberalism, the higher education sector has become much more global and much more commercialized. And so things like global rankings matter to a much larger extent than in the past. In the past, nobody thought about international rankings. But now, even though the rankings in a lot of ways are very questionable, students and parents still refer to those rankings. And that determines a lot of their decisions in terms of which universities they want to attend. So universities now, if they want to compete with each other, they have to pay attention to those rankings. And the way those rankings are calculated depends on many different factors, but one of them is a measure of internationalization. So how many foreign students you have, how many foreign faculty you have at your university, how many articles faculty publish in international journals. Those are all examples of measures of internationalization. And because of those reasons, I think Korean universities and the Korean government are very keen on attracting more foreign students. Are Korean universities selective when it comes to admitting foreign students, or do they just take as many as possible to fill seats? And is there a difference between the top universities and lower-ranked universities in Korea? I think Korean universities are selective, uh, especially the top universities. They want the top quality students. And the admissions process is quite selective, from my own experience. We interview every one of them. We want to get to know them. We just don't look at their applications. Uh, there is, so there is a process. In terms of the difference between the provincial universities and the universities in metropolitan Seoul, I think there is a difference. Because right now, for the most prestigious universities, people still want to come. 
right? So they don't have trouble filling student quotas, but for universities in the non-metropolitan areas, they're really desperate for students. So their um, admission criteria, I think, would be much less selective because they really need to admit a lot of students. So many Chinese students get admitted to universities. I'm not saying that they're low quality students, but nonetheless, I think the admission criteria are much less selective. So there's that difference. Regardless of the efforts made by the government and universities, you wrote a year ago that this diversity in Korean campuses is, and I quote, just for show. How did you come to this conclusion? So I came to this conclusion because I think there is a large gap between the rhetoric of Korean universities, which is they want to be very global, they want to be very internationalized, and therefore very diverse. That's all good, I think, and I think it's a really good start for universities to start thinking about those ideas. But my sense is that there's a, still a very large gap between rhetoric and practice or what you see in the everyday kind of interactions and decision-making that goes on in Korean universities. So that's what I meant. There's a gap between the reality and the rhetoric. But I think I would have to admit that it's all going in a positive direction. I think these types of ideas are doing much better now than 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. So I think Korean universities are going in the right direction, but you still see that gap. In a recent paper, you wrote that we are seeing structural diversity in South Korean universities, that is, diversity in terms of nationalities present on campus, but no educational diversity. What do you mean by this? When I talk about structural diversity, I mean um, the diverse range of foreign students who come to Korea and the numbers of students who come to Korea. What I mean by educational diversity is how much the South Korean university curriculum reflects this diversity and teaches about ideas like race and ethnicity, multiculturalism, and diversity within Korea. So when I said that there's no educational diversity, I meant that if you look at university course catalogs and course descriptions and analyze them, like I did in my paper, uh, you see that very surprisingly low levels, low numbers of courses talk about things like race, ethnicity, or subjects like foreign brides in Korea, migrant workers in Korea. I mean, there are very few courses that discuss these issues in a meaningful way. And if you compare the numbers with those of immigrant countries or even you know, non-immigrant countries, the numbers are so low. And surprisingly so, given that Korea has become a much more diverse place than in the past. So I, I was kind of expecting um, universities, at least, to kind of reflect that, but that's not really what I found. So in my kind of analysis of the South Korean university curriculum, I found that when courses talk about diversity, it's not really diversity within Korea. It's more diversity out there in the world. It's not really related to Korea. It's not something that Koreans you know, deal with on a daily basis. It's diversity in Latin America or you know, diversity you know, somewhere else, but not in Korea. But um, you can easily imagine courses that are designed to focus on you know, real issues that are going on in Korea, right? such as you know, migrant workers or the historical development of you know, minorities in Korea, like the Chinese. But even at the top universities, you don't really see that. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there's such a divide between multiculturalism, diversity, somewhere abroad, but never discussed about Korea? I think this is indicative of the tendency of Koreans not to embrace diversity. I mean, it's suggestive that this shows that Koreans are not ready to kind of really embrace you know, what's happening in Korea, although the numbers are still you know, quite low. Besides structural diversity and educational diversity, you also talk about intercultural diversity in your recent article. What does this third concept refer to? So this third concept refers to interaction between Korean students, local students and faculty, and foreign students. 
So to what extent is there a meaningful interaction between these two groups? Or do they just, are they just isolated from each other and they never talk to each other? In your article, you said that almost 60% of the foreign students you interviewed stated that they have either no or few Korean friends. What limits interactions between Korean students and foreign students when they are in practice in the same campus? I talk about three types of barriers. One of them is a language barrier, which you find in other countries as well, so nothing special. And that happens also because at Asian universities, a lot of them have programs that are run in English. So when you have an English program in an Asian country, I think it's inevitable that linguistic barriers will be there because the foreign students who come to Korea, or the majority of them, although there are many foreign students who study in Korean departments, a lot of them come to these Asian universities, like Korean universities, to English-based programs. So they don't expect to learn Korean unless they really have an interest in learning Korean or a need. But Korea is not a global language, so there's no real incentive for foreign students to learn Korean. So they just come to Korea, take courses in English with other foreign students, and it's difficult for them to even communicate or even speak with Korean students unless they're kind of in the same program. So there's, there's the language problem. Uh, another barrier or reason that foreign students don't have Korean friends is because of cultural reasons. Some foreign students are uncomfortable with the way that Koreans, Korean students make friends. I can't generalize by any means, but one of the most common ways of making friends in Korea is by going out and drinking together and playing drinking games. Although there are many student, Korean students who don't like to drink. But many foreign students feel very uncomfortable drinking in excessive amounts and playing those kinds of games. So they just don't go to them. And then, you know, there are lost opportunities for further contact. Uh, so that's just one example of a cultural kind of issue. Another one that has to do with culture is um, the culture of hierarchy in Korea and the sonbehube relationship. That makes many students uncomfortable. Even Asian students, like Chinese students, they don't really understand why that's necessary and, you know, why they have to, like, bow to somebody coming down the hallway and... Sometimes they're kind of reprimanded by their peers for not doing so, and getting used to that kind of culture is difficult for foreign students. So those are two examples. Another kind of reason why there's not that much interaction between Korean students and foreign students is because Korean students like to keep amongst themselves. I mean, this is true in any country, but Korean culture um, has kind of this idea of shared ethnicity, and it's, it's a very historical and cultural kind of legacy in Korea. And because of that, foreign students have told me that they think Korean students like to just kind of interact amongst themselves, and they're not really open to learning about other cultures, or they don't really feel the, the need. Sometimes they feel indifferent. Uh, that's what I meant by a shared ethnic identity that creates barriers to making friends with foreign students. The reason why I bring up shared ethnicity as a barrier is because even though Korean students can speak English, foreign students still feel this. So there are many programs uh, at Korean universities where Korean students are enrolled in an English-based curriculum or program, and they take classes with foreign students. But even if there's a common language medium, Korean students will still keep to themselves. So in that sense, you know, language isn't the only issue, um, like many people think. Among Korean students, there's a large range. And even among Korean students, they have different reasons for not wanting to interact with foreigners. Expanding on that, in your writings, you characterize Korean students as strangely pragmatic in the sense that they might not see any tangible benefits from interacting with uh, foreign students. Could you maybe elaborate on this? What I meant by um, a Korean students having a very pragmatic kind of view of foreign students is because 
when I interviewed them and talked to them about their views about foreign students and what foreign students were saying about them, they used that kind of language. They used that kind of pragmatic language as if, you know, foreign students, you know, what, the reason why, you know, they're in Korea is because, you know, they help Korean universities seem more international. They're here because the Korean government is giving them scholarships. They're fulfilling some kind of, you know, practical purpose. But in very few conversations, you know, did Korean students ever mention that they appreciated foreign students for what they brought to, you know, Korean universities or an opportunity for them to kind of learn from Korean students. I mean, there was never that kind of motivation or kind of reason for wanting to approach foreign students. It was always kind of a calculated, kind of instrumental kind of perspective. And um, a lot of the times, Korean students expressed kind of bitterness about foreign students based on some foreign students receiving scholarships very easily. And that kind of gives off the impression that anybody can come to Korea. So it's not as selective. Whereas Korean students have to, you know, work a lot to get into Korean universities. So in that sense, uh, I think Korean students tend to kind of look at foreign students as from a more pragmatic view. You also mentioned that many foreign students report cases of hierarchical racism. Could you tell us more about this? Um, so hierarchical racism is a concept that was used by other scholars. So I kind of borrowed that concept from scholars of like, Korean nationalism. And um, hierarchical racism basically means that there's a hierarchy of how the majority culture perceives different races, like Asians you know, versus Europeans. And foreign students that I, that I interviewed they felt that. They felt that Korean students tend to be nicer to Westerners and Western students, and not as much so to Asian students. And they could feel that, that difference in their everyday encounters with Korean students. And that's quite unfortunate, given that a very small minority of foreign students who come to Korea are Westerners, and the majority are Asian. So. I don't think that would leave a good impression for on Asian students when they come to Korea. But again, I mean, this kind of hierarchical racism exists elsewhere um, in Japan, where I'm conducting another study. And if you look at statistics on you know, how satisfied Asian students are when they've spent some time in Korea, they actually have the highest expectations versus people from other regions and other continents. But when they leave, they're the most dissatisfied. They have the highest expectations, and then later on, they're the most dissatisfied group. And I think this kind of hierarchical racism has something to do with that. How does this lack of educational and intercultural diversity at South Korean universities compare with the situation in other countries, especially with more multicultural countries, such as the United States, or, on the other hand, ethnically homogenous countries like Japan? Um, so if you compare Korean universities to American universities, it's very different. Well, number one, everybody wants to go to the US. It's their first choice. But people who come to Korea, it's not their first choice. And most students don't choose Korea. I mean, if you compare the numbers to the United States. So the US naturally draws a lot of foreign students to their higher education institutions. If you look at like student admissions, the US cares much more about diversity, I would say, than Korean universities as a criteria, right? They really value diversity. They really think diversity creates a better educational environment for students, for faculty, for the university. But that kind of mentality is largely absent in Korea, at least among, I think, the Korean academic community. So in the U.S., in terms of educational diversity, many universities have institutionalized diversity administrative positions, such as diversity officers. They also have requirements in the curriculum that require students to take a certain number of diversity courses or diversity-related 
courses on race or ethnicity or some other topic. So it's actually a requirement at many universities. And all of this is seen as very valuable, as being essential, but you don't really see that in Korea. Compared to other homogenous countries like Japan, it's very similar. So Korea and Japan have very similar kind of intakes of foreign students, although the absolute numbers in Japan is much higher because it's a bigger country. In terms of educational diversity, I haven't analyzed the Japanese curriculum, but I have looked at a lot of their courses and course offerings. And my sense is since Japan has been attracting foreign students much earlier than Korea, and they have a larger range of prestigious universities across Japan, my sense is that they offer more courses about diversity but I don't think that it's something that's valued as much as in the United States. So in that sense, I think Korea and Japan are quite similar. Obviously, a lot of students come to Korea to study, but once their studies is finished, once they graduate, do many students actually stay here? The answer is nobody knows <laughs> because nobody keeps statistics on foreign student employment in Korea. Universities don't. The government doesn't, so nobody knows exactly how much. But there have been some government commissioned studies. They estimate that perhaps 1% of foreign students stay in Korea to work. And I'm sure it's not that low. I'm sure it's perhaps a little bit higher, maybe 5%. But still, those are very low percentages. So given you know, how much foreign students want to come to Korea because they like Korea and they want to pursue a degree in Korea, I'm sure many of them want to work. But it's also been shown that, very interestingly, this is just one survey, so you know, I, I can't really generalize too much, but I think it was like a survey of 300 students, foreign students. And what it showed was that as much as 20% of those foreign students came to Korea wanting to continue their education in Korea or find a job in Korea. So they wanted to work in Korea, 20%, which isn't bad, but they were asked their freshman year. But by the end of their sophomore year, close to 0% of them didn't want to continue their education in Korea or work in Korea. And an increasing percentage wanted to continue their education elsewhere in a third, fourth country or back in their home country and continue to work in their home country. So as time went on, you, know, you see these inverse trends. I think that says a lot about what foreign students experience in Korea. They come with very high expectations, like, like I mentioned earlier, but tend to leave disappointed. And in a sense, it's reflected in the percentage of, of foreign students who, who stay in Korea, 1%. I mean, if you compare that to Japan, it's actually quite striking because in Japan, as much as 30% get employed. So I think that says a lot about the difference between the institutions of the two countries. Maybe Japanese universities give foreign students much more attention in terms of their employment opportunities, you know, job fairs, postings about employment opportunities, whereas Korean universities don't really give that kind of attention to foreign students. And it's hard to find your way around in Korea. Most job postings are in Korean. I mean, where are foreign students supposed to you know, find information about work? I think there's a difference between, in that sense between Japan and Korea, and that's something I really want to look more into in the future. In a prior interview, we discussed with former minister Pang Hanam about the aging of South Korean society. Wouldn't those students trained in Korea actually be a solution to counterbalance the aging Korean population? And does the government actually do anything to keep those students in Korea? I don't think that the government is doing anything substantial or meaningful at the moment. Because once foreign students come to Korea on a student visa, if they don't find a job by the time they graduate, I mean, they have to go back. The government doesn't even give them time to stay in Korea to find a job. So in that sense, I really think the immigration policies in Korea have to change. And you're right about foreign students as a source of skilled labor, of global talent, 
I think they have a lot to offer because, first of all, they a lot of them come to Korea because they like Korea, which means they want to work in Korea. So why not give them the opportunities? Um, and even if they decide to go back, that's okay. That's okay because they're going to have built social networks and ties during their you know, short-term employment in Korea. And if they maintain those ties and networks, even if they leave Korea, they can help bridge between Korea and wherever they go. Right? So it's not a last investment, I don't think. And also, it's very surprising how much foreign students acculturate to Korean culture. Many of them speak Korean very fluently. Many of them decide to, you know, marry Korean spouses. You know, they meet their girlfriends here or boyfriends here and they want to stay. They're culturally embedded here. They've been here for four years or more, pursuing an education, being immersed in the culture. So they know Korea more than, you know, other people, like other foreigners who've never even, you know, set foot in this country. So in that sense, they're very embedded in the culture. And in that sense, they're very valuable to Korea. The Korean government and Korean universities are not only interested in attracting international students, but also, as you mentioned previously, international professors. Why is that? And what motivates international faculty to come to South Korea? I had a chance to talk to a former president of a major Korean university to interview him, and I asked him the same question. I was really curious about why, why do Korean universities want to attract foreigners? And he said it's symbolic of internationalization efforts. I mean, that's what he said. Um, he said it's not really because they publish more in international journals, but if you have foreign faculty at a Korean campus, that says a lot of things. It reflects a lot about the university. Oh, I mean, if you see foreign faculty walking around campus, that gives an impression to foreigners and to the world, you know, that we're a global university, we're an international university. So his answer was, it's largely symbolic, which was kind of disappointing to me <laughs> as a foreigner, but um, I think that's part of it. Another reason, I think, is because, I mean, it's for practical reasons, because Some of the latest developments at Korean universities has something to do with building more kind of international colleges and graduate schools of international studies. I mean, those are pretty recent trends and you need foreign faculty or at least some to teach at those places. You can't just have Koreans. So in that sense, I think Korean universities want to attract more foreigners. And to answer your second question about motivations, Similar to foreign students, I think foreign faculty have a very diverse array of reasons why they want to come to Korea. It varies tremendously, I think. I think a very strong factor has to do with family ties. Like myself, I came to Korea because my, my mother lives in Korea. If she hadn't, I don't think I would have thought about coming here. I mean, similar to foreign students, foreigners want to experience Korea. They think it's a great place to work and to experience the culture. And some foreigners come because of that reason. It's a fun place to be for a couple of years, I think, when you're young, especially. And it's very dynamic here. Being a part of that, I think, is what motivates some people to come here. But there are other reasons as well. But I think those are the primary ones. A recent study conducted by Stephanie Kim of the UC Berkeley at your department, the Underwood International College at Yonsei University, concluded that many international faculty members leave within a few years as they feel isolated and see no opportunities for professional advancement. Do international faculty members thereby suffer from the same problems as international students? I think it's hard to generalize again because many faculty members stay in Korea for a long time and they think of Korea as their home. But at the same time, a lot of foreign faculty stay here for only a few years and then they decide to go to other places. I mean, sometimes I think foreigners or foreign faculty who come to Korea could make a greater effort to try to you know, learn Korean and in that way kind of get it more involved with the Korean community. That could open up more venues for professional advancement. But at the same time, I think Korean universities could utilize foreigners much more better than they are doing. I mean, not just for you know teaching English, but really getting them involved in the decision-making processes of the university. I think that would make for a more healthier university environment. And I think foreigners would appreciate that. 
previously you mentioned that foreign faculties had a symbolic value, that they were in some way the token foreigner in the department. But you also wrote, and I quote, that there is also a tendency among Koreans to perceive foreign faculty as second-tier scholars who are unable to secure employment in their countries of origin. Why is that? That perception does exist. I think part of the reason why that's the case is because a lot of the foreign faculty who come to Korea are junior faculty. They're right out of graduate school. And if you're right out of graduate school, you don't really have a lot of publications. You have to build up your publications. They could be potentially really great scholars, but at the moment, they don't really have anything to show for it because a lot of the people who come here are very young. Maybe sometimes Koreans, they don't realize that foreigners really want to come here. <laughs> they really want to come to Korea because they like being in Korea. And maybe there's this kind of assumption that the final destination that a foreign professor wants to go to is some Western country, which isn't the case in, in a lot of ways. So where do you see the root causes of these problems? In fundamental differences, like culture, identity, and even language, that are difficult to overcome in the short term? Or would better policies and a bit more effort from all sides already go a long way in moving forward? What measures should be taken to improve the situation? Yes, I do think that there are fundamental problems that are the cause. Things like culture change very slowly. If you think about it from that perspective, it's kind of it's demoralizing. But on the other hand, in the meantime, there are things that you can do that can change the culture or at least push culture in the right direction, such as institutionalizing diversity, different levels of the university, like in the leadership, being more representative, including foreigners on committees, giving them major positions. You don't see that a lot in Korea. A foreigner, I don't think, has ever been the dean or assumed a major responsibility or, or role at a Korean university. I think that says a lot about Korean universities and if they can be global. I think the university leadership could do more things about conveying a message about how the university values diversity. Changing the curriculum is one thing. I mean, that's a very simple thing that I think Korean universities can do. They could also offer some professional development courses for faculty who aren't used to teaching in intercultural settings. For some Korean professors, it's very uncomfortable when they have foreign students in their classes. Like, they don't know what to do. And that's the same for most people. I mean, most people are accustomed to teaching in monocultural classrooms, even in the United States in some areas. But like American universities, I think Korean universities could benefit a lot from offering those kinds of workshops or courses for faculty. I mean, faculty are important. They're the ones managing the classroom. And I think at the same time, that would really send a message to the broader community. They're trying to do something about this. I mean, I talked a bit about policies earlier, but I think one policy that really needs attention is letting foreign students spend more years in Korea after they graduate. So giving them more visa options so that they can have more time to find a job or consider other employment opportunities while they're in Korea and not being you know, forced to kind of leave or expected to leave. That would send a very strong message, I think. It's a different matter when you ask students to leave. I mean, I think that's kind of the expectation But if the policies were to change and students were given visas or visa extensions, that would send a very strong message. Little things like posting job information, employment information for foreign students on websites, I think that would really make an impact as well. And also monitoring the alumni networks once students graduate and keeping them informed of what's going on in Korea. I mean, little things like that, I think, would also send a very strong message message that would help change the culture. Looking into this topic, one cannot help but wonder whether the internationalization of Korean universities is a project that is being imposed top-down and not really welcomed by the bottom section. The government and university administrators apparently want to internationalize, but do Korean students and Korean professors actually have the same interests? 
when I've spoken to kind of senior administrators about how they promote internationalization and how important they think internationalization is to kind of the academic community in general, they say it's very difficult to make the Korean faculty cooperate with them. Because since so many of the policies in Korea are top-down, very centralized, a lot of them are kind of imposed. And then the people at the bottom, they're kind of indifferent to what's happening. And they're kind of, oh, this is something we have to do again. Um, So there is that gap, as you stated. Sometimes the administration and the Korean faculty do not have the same interest. They have different interests. I mean, that's a constant struggle, it's a constant conflict, and it's difficult to kind of motivate people at the bottom to do things. I've heard that in Japan, this is very serious. So the Japanese faculty or professors have a lot of authority there, and a lot of them just aren't interested in internationalization. Um, Whereas in Korea, there's been a lot of progress in terms of motivating, providing incentives for Korean faculty to publish in English and in international journals. It's very hard to do that in Japan, even though the government is trying to do it. And... um, trying to encourage Korean faculty to teach in English. I mean, that was a huge change. It was a huge reform. I mean, nobody taught in English in Korea 20 years ago. <laughs> but all of a sudden, you know, some departments, half their courses are taught in English. If you go to places like KAIST, 40 to 50% or even higher, 80 to 90% now are taught in English. I mean, that's very surprising for a non-English speaking country like Korea. Many changes have been made over the past 20 years. Korean universities are still quite successful in making those changes, even though, I mean, there's always disagreement. People don't want to cooperate. They're still taking place. You wrote earlier this year that the current situation is, and I quote, an instance of Korea's continued attempts to selectively adopt elements of globalization for national interests a familiar paradigm in Korea's historical legacy of social change. Could you tell us more about this? This um, paradigm or way of thinking about Korean globalization was an idea that I took from a book published by Professor Gyukshin about ethnic nationalism in Korea. And the argument is basically that Koreans don't really see a contradiction between nationalism and globalization. There's a tendency to think that globalization can be adopted, and Koreans are very eager to, but it doesn't necessarily mean they have to change anything about their culture or you know, the legacy of ethnic nationalism in Korea. So in that sense, it's just an instrumental adoption, selective adoption. So you can adopt elements of globalization, like structural diversity, bringing foreigners in, but you don't necessarily have to go through with all the other kinds of reforms that would qualitatively lead to a meaningful kind of change, like intercultural diversity. So I was kind of using those terms within this broader framework of globalization and nationalism and how Koreans tend to think of nationalism or globalization in instrumental ways rather than to embrace it wholeheartedly. Does that mean that at the end of the day, international students and faculty members are just means to an end for Korean universities, for the Korean government. They help the project of internationalization, but they are otherwise not really welcome as full-fledged members of the department, university, or even the country? Yes, um, I think that's partly true, that up until now, I mean, even though I mean, the situation has gotten much better than in the past, Foreign faculty are not embraced as full members of the academic community yet, and more can be done about that. In that sense, foreigners might be embraced for instrumental reasons because they help fulfill certain purposes, like helping to raise global rankings, or helping to attract international students, or helping Korean universities seem more global or international. But they're not embraced in other ways that could be more meaningful to those people who come here. There's still a lot to be done, I think. To conclude, against this backdrop, are you optimistic about the internationalization prospects of Korean universities? 
will we see not only structural but also educational and multicultural diversity in the future? Given what's happened over the past two decades in terms of internationalizing Korean universities and how they've changed, yes, I'm very optimistic. I don't think that those changes are going to come immediately or anytime soon, but uh, I think they'll come eventually. But it's going to be a, a long process, I think. And in a globalizing world, I think if Korean universities can do it quicker, And at a faster pace, they would have a lot to gain from those reforms. Professor Renny Moon, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.